All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's JPM City Friday seminar. My name is Dan Lowe, and along with John Evans, we have the pleasure of curating the seminar series this year. So, before we begin, on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, I'd like to acknowledge the Turtle and Jaguar people as the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today. We pay our respects to the ancestors and their descendants who continue a cultural and spiritual connections with the country and will recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. It's my pleasure today to introduce Professor Tom Nation. Tom is Research Director at the Cooperative Research Centre for Transformations in Mining Economies, or CIC Time. With a background in human geography, uh, he has over 25 years' experience in designing and delivering integrated research programs focused on regional communities, the resources sector, and transitions. His research focuses on social and economic dimensions of mine and new energy across Australia, including regional development, community aspirations, employment, income inequality, demographic, social license, regional government, governance, and climate adaptation. He provides expert advice to governments and industry on a range of social and economic issues. His presentation today is entitled Transformations in Mining Economies, Lessons from CRC Time, Foundational Phase and Next Step. So please join me in welcoming Tom. Thanks so much, Daniel, and thanks to Tom and to everyone here today. Uh, it's a really great opportunity to be here. It's a real pleasure. Uh, so, uh, as Daniel mentioned, the title of my talk is Transformations in Mining Economies, Lessons from Circe Time, Foundational Phase and Overview of New Projects, and, and also some recent projects so I've started, started over the last six months or so. Uh, worth noting, just at the beginning, we are about two and a half years into this CLC time, so it's a kind of a good time to, to take stock and, and have a think about what we've learned so far and have a think about what's coming next. Before I get too far, this um, the reference. Well, I have to click on that. Yeah. There we go. Uh, we acknowledge the traditional custodians across all the lands on which we live and work, which the CSA time is across Australia. And we pay our respects to elders, both past and present, and also just want to reiterate. Uh, point down anyway before acknowledging the Jaguar and Cherbourg peoples where we are today. So, I'll just tell you a little bit about CLC time. Sorry, I don't think they can see the screen. You don't think so? I'm trying to seamlessly not interrupt the flow, but now I've done it. So, we're just uh, Daniel's coming back with some technical uh, adjustments. Not the functioning, so, but it's strange that no one replied. Yeah, some of the messages. Oh, oh, excellent. We're good to go. Sorry, Bob. No, thank you for just checking those technical details. So, um, I'll tell you a little bit about CLC time. Uh, as uh, Daniel mentioned, it is the Cooperative Research Center for Transformations in Mining Economies. Uh, we we're located in multiple sites. So we have an office here in Brisbane at the UQ SMI building, and we also have an office in Perth, where we have our main office and we have staff in in uh, Melbourne and also in South Australia. So we're quite diverse. We're quite spread out, and also just acknowledging the work of our SMI colleagues who produced this lovely map showing mine closures over the years to come. So we have quite a few red dots indicating mine closures over the last five, over the next five years, yellow dots over the next five to 10 years, um, and uh, also uh, over the next sort of 15 years. And if you add them all up, we have 
around 50% of existing mines expected to close over the next 25 years, with many in a much shorter time frame from that. So closure is a big issue and it's a near-term issue. Uh, and while there will be mines opening, that does not detract from the fact that closure is a disruptive process. It is a process which has a big effect on regional communities, on, on um, workforces, has a big effect on, um, on the environment, has a big effect on traditional owners, has a big effect in many different ways. Uh, I think it's um, also worth noting that to date, the focus on closure has been about closing the mine itself, not about what comes next. That has not been a big focus. So that is very much part of our raison d'etre. We are around what comes after mining, both in terms of the social economic effects of that, in terms of what that means for the environment, in terms of all the different dimensions, uh, recognizing that what comes after mining may involve some of the same people, but it may involve different people as well. So that's an important part of the recognition there. Another aspect is that mine regulation as it relates to closure and so on is focused at the site scale more so than the regional scale. So if you have a a whole region closing, for example, uh, you might get that. We've seen that, for example, in, in the US, um, where whole regions close. We've seen that in Germany. We've seen that in many places. Uh, the focus is very much on what happens at the site scale, not at the regional scale. And there's no clear regulatory path to next land uses, to transition. So it's not actually discussed in mining legislation and regulation and so on at least not much. We're starting to see a bit of that coming through now. So there's a quite a, a wide set of reasons, and important reasons why we need something like CLC time, which goes on to the next uh, slide, which is very much around our purpose. So we have a range of factors here, and I won't go to read all of them out, but just want to pick out a few highlights. So part of the issue is around reducing the number of abandoned mines, so the abandoned mine estate, which is often discussed and often using some quite large numbers. Some of those numbers are debated, but whatever it is, there's quite a few of them, and uh, some of them require considerable attention. Through to not just a focus on problems, but really a focus on opportunities. So there's resources, there's infrastructure, there's uh, skill populations. There's a whole lot of opportunity which we see when it comes to uh, mine closure and transition. So in terms of mission, uh, we bring together a diverse uh, range of stakeholders to help reimagine and dramatically transform Australian mine closure outcomes. And in terms of our vision, we see closure as a valued cornerstone for post mining economies and the mining industry, something to be proud of, doing it well, but also building enduring benefit for all Australians. So it's very much around shifting from what you might call it being a, something to deal with at the end of life cycle and, and a transition to something new. I'll tell you a little bit about that partnership. I think probably one of the most uh, impressive things which struck me coming into CRC when I joined a bit over a year and a half ago was the number of partners. So that number is 80 partners. We have 80, around 80 partners. They, they do change. Sometimes we gain an extra one. Occasionally, some people have uh, completed their partnership, but it's it's mostly a growing number. When I first had the CRC time, it was 50 and now it's 80. So it is a large number of partners who are involved and we need a large number of partners and we need partners from a wide range of different backgrounds and different areas of focus, which we have here on the slide. As you can see, um, regions and communities are very much around uh, regional development organisations, local councils, these sorts of uh, entities government, particularly state governments, but all those government researchers are a crucial part of CLC time, obviously, and we have First Nations as well, mining companies and METS companies, so the services companies. And we have board representation, so on the CLC time, but we have 
representation from all of these areas, which is uh, very important for having a, a balanced view and a diverse view. Where would that at? Yep, yeah, cool. Um, who, and they all bring different types of resources and contributions. So some of those contributions are financial, some of them are in kind. There are some uh, community organizations, regional organizations who don't have large budgets, but they do have time and they have expertise and they have knowledge and they have know-how which they contribute to CLC time. Uh, and something similar for all of our partner areas, we have this range of contributions and, and we have close to $30 million from the Commonwealth as part of the CRC program, which is over a 10 year time frame. So we've, we have quite a lot of resources to uh, bring to bear on these problems, but they're all, and, and solutions there, but they're also quite complex and they're uh, quite diverse. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. Um, also like to, Highlight what I said in the beginning, we're co-located. That's important to have representation uh, certainly on both coasts. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be based at University of Queensland. And we also have staff um, have a big office or our main office in Perth as well, associated with the University of Western Australia. We're guided by a First Nations inclusion strategy. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a minute. And we also have strong engagement with our regional partners through what began as what we call regional hubs, but we thought of them more so as networks. So these are networks of partners which connect our research uh, with regional um, stakeholders and groups. So, and these are in these different locations here, Pilbara, Bowen Basin, the Shrove Valley, Southwest WA and South Australia. So um, I'll just mention some of the sort of strategic architecture, including that First Nations inclusion strategy. There we go. Yeah. First of those is our research prioritization plan, which was developed in 2021. So we're a fair way into that now. It does have eight areas of research priority. We put regions in transition right in the middle, so everything kind of feeds into that, but it is its own priority in its own right. And then we have informing regulatory excellence for transitions, so a focus on regulation, delivering post-mining options. It's, it is very much around looking at the options which are available and could be available. We have uh, enhancing decision systems for positive closure. That includes quite a lot of work, which would be what we call in economics, for things like the way closure is, the cost of closure is calculated and attributed across the mine cycle, mine life cycle. So for example, that includes work looking at net present value calculations and discount rates, which in some cases can, uh, postponing the cost of dealing with closure and potentially um, underestimate some of those costs as well. So we we sort of put the costs, we, we look at the what that might cost into the future and we, we, we look at, in some cases, not the full picture. So this area of research is to, to look at ways to do that better, to actually have a more inclusive approach at different types of um, costs and to look at them over different time frames. Uh, bringing into what we might call tangible and intangible sorts of uh, considerations as well. We also have implementing technology for a positive impact. So there's a very strong technological aspect uh, and in innovating supply chains for post, well, well, for business solutions as well. As we mentioned earlier on, moving from the site scale is part of, uh, part of the issue. So we have an area of uh, a research priority for looking at cumulative impacts. And another one, which is around demonstration and data solutions. So people need to be able to see what, what, what is good practice, the focus on demonstration, uh, and also um, the role of you know, data analytics in, uh, in that process. So I'll just move on to what we call our impact factor. This is another key area of our architecture for how we think about what we're doing, what drives our decision-making and the sort of work that we do. And 
There's quite a lot in this, but I'd just like to hone in on what we call that sort of middle box there. And there's what we call the impact objectives. So that minds are closed in ways that deliver social, economic, and environmental value. That's an impact objective. But the actual closure process generates value. Also, the closed sites and repurposing enable a faster transition to more, more resilient local economies. So there's a focus on the resilient local economies and the transition process. That mine closure business solutions drive new commercial and or regional closure opportunities. So there's a very strong focus on uh, the business solutions to that. Part of this is also around continued investment in Australian resources. So one of the considerations which came into CLC time is if we do have a lot of mines which are struggling to close or don't close well, at some point that will catch up with the um, with the viability of the overall resources sector. That, that is a possibility. So this is an important one too, to make sure that in doing all this, there is confidence in the resources sector to continue in its role in Australia. And then finally, uh, policy decision-making and management systems reduce risks. So obviously um, there have been four examples in the past. We want to avoid those, we want to do better and we want to reduce risk. So these are, these are all uh, impact objectives. The next piece is what we call our First Nations inclusion strategy. It's a very important area for CLC time and I think for the resources sector and for regional communities in general. And it comprises a set of commitments and principles which we uh, followed. Uh, and it includes uh, four focus areas all with target outcomes. As the research director, the one of those which is most connected to, to me is very much around the nature of the research that we do and what sort of research, who has a say in that research, how do we do it, that kind of thing. So uh, I will mention just a few of those. And a key part of that is we are guided by a First Nations advisory team who play a role in uh, in the uh, development of the projects or in guiding the development of projects. So we have uh, the team here on the right-hand side, chaired by uh, Jim Walker, uh, who's um, based at UQ. And so the First Nations advisory team has a key role in guiding the First Nations inclusion in the project development process, that we take an inclusive approach. Uh, to development and to co-design, and that we consider things like ethics approval really carefully and uh, and, and really uh, thoroughly, and we, we, we really look at that, what, what that means in terms of um, developing our projects. Uh, now, CLC time management is responsible for the overall implementation of this strategy, and that includes a whole series of objectives for example, that of the PhD students we support, mm -hmm. uh, a proportion of those will be First Nations candidates and that the, the proportion will exceed or at least double what is the national benchmark. So that is, that is one of our targets. Um, but also the First Nations people have paid roles in research design and implementation. This is not seen as a kind of an after the effect add-on or something like that. It's a paid role and it's an important part of budgeting. It's an important part of project design. So, and there's a, there's a number of other key, what you might call elements or, or outcome areas in the research uh, strategy, in the research um, area. Uh, I can't list them all here, but we do have the link there to the overall First Nations inclusion strategy for, for going into more depth into all of those. I'll just give it a move on now to the foundational portfolio and mention a little bit about the portfolio. Um, there were 22 projects in this portfolio. They were synthesis projects, background projects. They were for contextualization of the research to come. We're based here at UQ. UQ was deeply involved in many of these, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge and thank all of the UQ researchers who were involved in these. They were also around building networks of practice. So these projects had 
teams which came from multiple institutions that was a design feature so that we were not working in silos or kind of we're trying to build connections and uh, they were very much around combining and bringing together and integrating different knowledge bases from different stakeholder perspectives and identifying gaps for further research as well they were generally short projects sort of around 12 months some of them even shorter uh, and there was around 1.9 million of cash invested in those and some additional in-kind value and, in and other contributions which raised the portfolio to around $5 million, uh, which, was, which is now completed. Um, and they were across these five areas. So one, one was regional economic development, uh, very much around post mine land uses, looking at the regulatory aspects, the things which uh, we mentioned in the research prioritization plan and which correspond to our program one, which is economic development, uh, and also the risk evaluation and planning area, which I mentioned before. So understanding stakeholder values, that's important. So it turned out to be very, very important. Uh, exploring issues in mine closure planning. So actually looking at the process of planning, kind of the, the way it works in the industry and looking at current tools and techniques which underpin that, and also identifying some risks and opportunities in mine closure planning. So that's very much around that, that sort of second area. Operational solutions, we had quite a large portfolio pro of projects here, looking at integrated biophysical modeling, uh, standardizing approaches to remote sensing, mine site water options and water management options and looking at water returning ecosystem resilience a project around mine landform stability um, and also barriers to reducing acid mine drainage so uh, we had as i mentioned a lot of uq involvement in these not just from smi but also from other parts of uq as well then we had a whole set of projects around collaborative infrastructure dynamically uh, informing and transforming assessment processes through shared analytics framework. We had the mine rehabilitation trials online platform process of looking at how we could do that. A network of demonstration sites for testing, uh, looking at a, a knowledge hub, a sort of a, a tool for sharing knowledge and a, and a project looking at an abandoned mine, looking at abandoned mines and and how you might develop uh, an atlas of those or how you might develop a, a database of those which could be useful. Um, then we had some projects around understanding pathway to impacts, the foundations of effective indigenous inclusion and climate transitions and closure. So this whole portfolio was designed to be multifaceted and integrated. And I had the joy of reading all the work which came out of this, I think something like 3,000 pages of course, um, and really thinking through what does all that mean? What does it mean? Uh, it, was a, it was a joy and I distilled three overarching lessons. So there's lots of lessons from all of it and they, there's lots of lessons depending on what your particular focus is. But there were three overarching ones, which I'd like to highlight. And the first one is that there is limited recognition of the concept of transition and what it means in practice. That is an area where there is limited recognition. Second one is that post-mining transition is fundamentally about values. That came through not just in the project, which we call the project of our values, but it came through in many projects and particularly in all the kind of evaluation and planning type projects. It's all around the values that you, you um, recognize and, and work with. And for the biophysical dimensions, there were three particular key issues. And one was integration. So starting with integration between the biophysical aspects, but also with the biophysical aspects and the other elements of my project scale and forecasting. So these are the, so these are three kind of fundamental kind of core questions which came out of the biophysical area. 
I'm going to spend a slide on each of these lessons. So looking at this first one, that there's limited recognition of the concept of transition, what it means in practice, this lack of recognition is in stark contrast to the concept of closure. So people can talk about closure with confidence. There may be some areas of debate, but people generally agree on a lot of things. Uh, it's defined in regulation. It might be defined a little bit differently depending on which jurisdiction you look at, but closure is very much defined uh, clearly in any single uh, jurisdiction. And there is very general agreement on some key elements of closure. So the principles of safe, stable, and non-polluting, or some variations of that, are pretty widely accepted and pretty widely recognised. Uh, there's no such agreement when it comes to post-modern transition. What is that? Who does it? Who's involved? Where does it happen? How does it happen? Over what time frame? All of that. It's it's basically uh, nowhere near as as um, settled as the as the as closure, which makes sense because people have been paying attention to closure for a long time, um, and less so to postmodern transition. But this lack of recognition and this lack of agreement it hinders the planning processes and it hinders the ability to progress this. So this is a, an area which is needed uh, a dialogue on what post transition means from diverse perspectives and in diverse contexts and small shout out to a session at our annual forum we had uh, in uh, late 2022 and, and recognizing Anthony Kung's work this is one of the topics which came up through our forum process but but there were others which came through but but uh, this is a quite a, quite a big one so we need a dialogue on what that means and we need to look at case studies and we need to look at scenarios of how this how this happens so post mining transition is fundamentally about values, is a second kind of overarching uh, lesson. There's a strong need to understand and respect a wide range of values and different contexts, and the role of place is crucial. So these values or sort of sets of values, they vary by, by within places and between places, and particularly between different areas. So, what closure means and what transition means in the Latrobe Valley is very different to what it means in Gove, very different to what it means in Collie, and very different to what it means uh, in the Bowen Basin, looking at completely different time frames, completely different uh, structures of the, the way mining works and what might follow. It's a very different discussion. This is important. Um, but also to understand values in these strong relationships, particularly with traditional owners uh, who will be there before who were there before mining and will be there after mining. This is an important, important point. Um, and also another point here is that post-mining transitions should be net positive. In other words, the benefits should outweigh costs. Uh, another area I just wanted to mention here is that we need a commitment to deliberation to ensure that post-mining transitions incorporate these values. And this is some, some work I'll mention in terms of new work. We're particularly starting this in the Trove Valley where they're very much um, in the middle of a transition which is happening right now with, with certain closures already completed and other closures in the near future and the medium term as well. So the third one was that for biophysical dimensions, the key issues are integration, scale, and forecasting. Uh, so um, recognizing here that the state of knowledge in the biophysical areas is relatively more advanced thanks to the work of institutes such as SMI and thanks to the work of institutes such as uh, the Curtin School of Mines and to many other institutes which have done a lot of this work, which is very valuable work. Uh, but there's still an area for integrating what we might call biophysical dimensions. They're not necessarily integrated uh, or not as integrated as they could be or should be. Scale is another factor. So shifting from a site scale to a regional scale came up several times throughout the foundational projects. And that forecasting is, a, is an important topic. So being able to predict over the medium term and the long term, for example, 
what are the ecological outcomes going to be looking like for this site 100 years ahead, 150 years ahead? That's, that's an important area as well. I will make a special note of water because water, uh, it does require special attention due to its fundamental importance ecologically, socially, economically. It is such an important element. So um, uh, it came out as a really kind of key aspect uh, from, from the foundation phase. Couldn't get away with just three key messages. I, I felt like I needed to add a little bit more. That's just how I am. So um, the other one is the importance of framing. So key key element which came to us again and again throughout this foundational portfolio. It's it's important to think what are you transitioning into as opposed to what are you transitioning out. A lot of the focus has been on what does this mean for what we do today in this mine or in this site. A lot of the focus needs to be on what will happen here, what should happen here, what will, what's the next land use. So um, we do have some examples of that. Of obviously, for example, like the Kingston Pump Hydro project, we need more examples and we need to look at them in more detail. Uh, but to be viable, these options, so options for future land for uh, next land uses, they need to be feasible economically, environmentally, and socially. They need, they need to be desirable. Uh, and they need to be possible from a technical perspective. So um, I have been to uh, motor racing tracks on, on uh, repurposed mine sites. Great for where they are, might not be technically feasible everywhere, might not be desirable everywhere, uh, might not be um, economically viable either everywhere. But it's it's good to think about what is possible and what is uh, locally viable. Another insight is uh, the importance of infrastructure. So quite often, if you look at you know the approval conditions or the, the sort of the closure requirements, these would be de decommissioned as part of the closure process. So if you have an airport, you would dismantle the airport. If you have a electricity supply which was built for a town for a mining town, you would de de you would uh, um, decommission that electricity supply. These things have uses for, for the next, for those communities who continue to live there and do other things. So this is an important part of the whole transition story, um, looking at transport networks, telecommunications, equipment, buildings, cables. Uh, cable infrastructure was, was quite a part of the Kidston case, um, having that cable infrastructure there. It still needed upgrading. But to have it in there in the first place was important. Um, also recognizing that when you repurpose something doesn't mean necessarily it's easy. So there's costs to maintain these things. There's costs to upgrade them or to make them fit to purpose for purpose. They may have degraded due to timeframes. Um, and they may not necessarily support the access to markets and access to customers, which have changed as mine, my, mining might close. So the airport might no, may no longer be viable. That's the important part. So I'm gonna talk about some selected new projects or recent projects. We do have more than I have time for to go into today. So this is a kind of a highlights, not a full kind of uh, comprehensive list. But I'll start with the improved prediction remediation of acid mine drainage, recently commenced project. Uh, so this project, uh, it's actually our largest project. It's a five year project. It's a large team. And it's got, um, in terms of the scale of this project, it's bigger than the entire foundational portfolio. So this one project is bigger than the 22 projects I mentioned before. It's an important project because it's an important issue. Um, and uh, it, focused on, on a, it focuses on addressing AMD by examination of mine waste behavior at the MISO scale. Again, coming back to that issue of scale, which we talked about before, uses mineralogy and microbiology for assessment and remediation of the uh, undersaturated mine waste zone. It addresses the gap between lab scale methodologies and mine site implementation. Again, through this uh, emphasis on mesoscale testing, 
and developing improved acid-based testing procedures for AMD uh, waste disposal planning. So it is a significant project. UQ is significantly involved, as is Linda's and some of our other partners. Uh, I've got the link there if you'd like to find out more about this project and we can put you in touch with the staff on this project if you'd like to discuss that one more. Uh, regional Economic Transition Framework. So this is a project just starting, only recently contracted. And it's around how to secure uh, and leverage mining benefits over the long term. It particularly takes a long-term focus, very suitable for regions where mining is expected to be a big part of the near-term, medium-term sort of decades to come. It's actually thinking well in advance, this project. Let's let's really think well in advance what's going to happen in places like the Palm Basin, what's going to happen in places like the Pebble Brown. And it's looking at the pathways for the what's going on in those economies, uh, looking at the elements of those economies which are conducive to complementary activities along the way, what is the nature of the skill space, what is the nature of the infrastructure, what is the structure of those economies? What are the things that are going to be compatible with mining while it continues and then can continue to grow uh, when mining eventually closes? This long-term view is very important um, and, it, and, and it's a different set of methods to what you would use when something is closing in a short time frame. Uh, very important to establish a strong a stakeholder consultation process for this and to really look at the structure of those economies and how they've been evolving over time and how they can best evolve in a way that is conducive to what people want in those economies. So, uh, and in those regions, uh, providing locally relevant and custom data analytics. As part of that, they're looking at developing some tools which provide information about all mining regions in a kind of more general sense, but they're gonna hone in on particular mining regions and take that long-term view. This is really important because sometimes, one of the things we've observed, for example, in Collie, that some of the changes which happened in Collie with the closure of mines in Collie took 30 years of, of work to come up with some of those uh, post-mining land uses. It took 30 years, and it, which is not to say that work was necessarily evenly managed over that time frame. It might have been you know, certain conversations, certain, certain planning, certain kind of thinking, certain people doing certain things, but it's a long time process. The German, we often look at the German experience for uh, closure of coal. That was a 40 year process, very active involvement, planning, regional government, state government, industry. It's a 40-year process. So looking at what's in the economy, looking at how it works, looking at where it can go, who's involved, what are the kind of desirable long-term outcomes. That's very much the focus of this project. Collaborative well, planning for post-mine um, uh, closure in the Trobe Valley, it's a much nearer term project. So closure is already underway. We have one mine closed, we have one power station closed, we have another one scheduled to close within the next, so, well, short term, medium term as well. Uh, and this is very much looking at what are the options for the landform, starting with the landform, because that does have a very strong influence on what you can do with that land and, and who does it. So starting with that. But it's about a platform for deliberation. It's about building on the, the work that has already happened there, the studies that have already happened there, and bring it together and synthesizing it. Uh, and to kind of build what you might call community literacy on the opportunities and also the challenges and some of the constraints too. I mean, you can't just do everything at this point in that closure process. They haven't had necessarily the benefit of that kind of 40 year journey closure plan experience. Um, but this is a very important project and it's very uh, focused on delivering constructive outcomes and um, also things which are reasonable, sort of realistic and feasible. So uh, it's, a, it's an excellent project and it's, um, again, just starting up now. We have more information on this here. Regional cumulative effects assessments. 
this is a staged project. So this is just the first stage. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it goes on to the second stage or third stage, but but it's if this stage goes well or goes according to what's in the plan, then we have potential for follow-up stages. Uh, it's looking at case studies of assessments uh, that help to, to guide uh, cumulative impact assessment and, and, and effects. It's not all negative, so we use the term effects rather than impacts. Impacts tends to convey a, uh, a focus on problems. Effects can also be positive. And there have been many attempts to, to deliver cumulative assessment processes around the world, and they're all a bit different, and they also have slightly different purposes. So this project is actually looking at the different ways you can go about that and the strengths and benefits and then the kind of the use utility of those different processes and what that means in Australia. Um, and then potentially recommending some uh, sites for uh, follow-up um, case studies. Again, we have more information on this one here. Natural capital accounting in the mining sector. So this is some work we started last year and it's um, sort of, so it's recent work. The aim is to develop a compelling business case for natural capital accounting and really looking at all of the different, like accounting for all these different forms of natural capital, carbon, water, biodiversity, all these different elements, aspects, and looking at the barriers to the uptake of these natural capital accounting frameworks as well, and looking at some case studies of where it has been applied and has been useful and how, and how to um, uh, extend those case studies and expand and provide guidance for, for other work. Looking at opportunities for um, arising from engagement with the natural capital accounting systems. So this is some work uh, led by uh, Brian Maybe, who is our program two lead leader, is an economist based in Perth, and it's it's a very interesting project as well, and very very um, timely considering the industry interest in this, these frameworks and the government interest in these frameworks. I will mention a project which is about to start. So this is sort of in the contracting process. Foundations of Mine Closure. A course, a course on that. One of the things which came out of all of our work so far, again, at this two and a half years point, is there's not enough training, awareness raising on what closure is and what transition is. And we need to provide more information to people, provide more training, give people more training. It's quite interesting. So a lot of demand for this came from the closure teams who work in the companies we for our partners, not because they needed the training, but they they are the, they're a sort of a small number of people. So it's, we need we want other people to have access to this training. We want people who are not working immediately and directly in closure, but are connected to closure to have a greater awareness of what is needed. So it does have a better connection throughout the business, throughout throughout the rest of the, the company's different sections. Um, so we are looking, and also so that all partners involved in closure have a better understanding of that and, and, and transition. So we're uh, commissioning this course. And in addition to that, we're going to be providing what you might call a um, a uh, strategic assessment of where that fits in the training landscape as a sort of additional component. And then the final uh, proposal, or, yeah, work starting soon, I just want to mention is a Songlines National Training Pathway. This is an Indigenous-led project. It's going to be looking at the enablers for more Indigenous involvement mm -hmm. in the closure process and also tailoring closure training and training in general to enable greater participation uh, of First Nations people in closure, but also in the conversation about closure. So in, in the negotiation processes, in the discussions of, of what should happen in the various places where uh, closure is um, going to happen. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much and open for questions.
Thank you, Tom, for that presentation. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience or online? If you can enter your questions in the Q and A box, or raise your hands and I can then unmute you and you can uh, ask directly. Thank you, Sam. Hmm. Thank you. That was intriguing. So I have this uh, long problem in Australia, I suppose, coming from New Zealand, that many of the mineral deposits are out there in the centre in the brown lands, which I would argue were up part of the heart of the rehabilitation. And then we have this big group called the Greens, who are really, I suppose, anti the, I suppose you'd say, the destruction of the tree environment, which to me is actually easier to rehabilitate, rehabilitate. So we've got this problem in our industry that I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the natural capital accounting space, in that really in terms of the whole value the chain, Perhaps it's better to be in the tree environment where it's actually you know, easier to rehabilitate rather than, you know, if you put a track through a Tasmanian forest, it's gone in 10 years. If you leave one in the desert out there, Brackham Hill, there, it's there 100 years later. So I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are in that sort of space. Uh, yeah, look, thanks for the question. Um, let's just go back to this uh, wonderful map prepared by some of our colleagues. Here is my. And mining that happens in all those places, you know. So you mentioned in the tree places, but also in the um, in the kind of the non-tree places. Uh, is it easier? Is it harder? How do people respond to it? They're really good questions, and uh, they will be different. In different contexts, and I think that that whole focus on values and and place is what one of it comes. It's so uh, important to addressing those questions. Uh, I think perhaps part of the answer to that question is not so much necessarily where the minds are, but where the people are. So the people who are more distributed along the coast might have a different view about mines which are closer to them or further away. Those are all kind of questions to, to consider, I think. I mean, we don't have a sort of definitive answer to the right here right now. Um, uh, is closure more difficult, more easy in certain places than others? Again, I love the question, but I guess all these mines need to close. So whether they're a little bit easier, a little bit harder, we need to do well for all of them. Um, but look, it's a great discussion. I'd love to follow up on that sometime. All right, we have a question from online. So how do you ensure that this approach won't end up with more regulation or front loaded costs that acts as a further disincentive to developing new deposits, which often start small before being expanded over time? Again, it's a really, really good question. Uh, how do I guarantee that? We can't give guarantees, unfortunately. Um, it, is a, it, is, it is an area that we are sensitive to. So one of the things uh, has ha we've been of, you know, observed, for example, uh, sometimes when you have reviews of um, regulations, looking to streamline regulations and so on, sometimes... Uh, it has been observed that those reviews actually result in more regulations. So yeah, these are these are things that we are aware of. Um, I think what we have observed, and I'm going to go back to this slide here. So this is the Cable Eco Discovery Centre. Um, we went to visit a site, it's, it's owned by Iluka, went there a bit recently, and Iluka uh, were approached by this, um, this wildlife group. They said, we'd like to have a wildlife sanctuary here. And Iluka said, well, okay, yeah, that's fine, we can do that. Um, and um, they said, okay, we'd also like to build a wildlife hospital. They said, well, 
all fine from our perspective. You know, it'll, that works for us. We do need to uh, update our own regulatory process. I mean, it, we, we, our regulation requires that this site becomes uh, native native vegetation, which in some ways we're not entirely um, happy with because before we took it on, it was state forest and state forest and native vegetation, different sites. But you know, that's we we sign up to that, so we're all good. But if we want to, if you want to do the wildlife uh, hospital and the wildlife sanctuary, we we like that. We'll work with you on that. And we'll we'll make that a little bit. Um, yeah, we'll we'll prepare the site for that. Um, the issue here is that everyone agrees on what should be done with this site, but they are unable to change their regulatory approval process in order to do what everyone wants. So regulation is definitely a big part of this. How can we guarantee that this won't create more regulation? I don't know. I think the problem we have here, it's not so much that the regulation doesn't exist or there's too much of it. It's about just taking a decision, a decision that everyone wants. And I think there's a very real, there, are, there are genuine reasons why, in this case, the regulators have not signed up that deal because they don't want to be left with a white elephant if this if this wildlife hospital, you know, doesn't work out, it, 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 it has some problems, it's a, people walk away. That, there's a hang on a second, you know, we we don't want to be left with that. So I understand their, their logic. But there's a lot of people who are trying to converge on transition to something which was a mine site and now it's going to be something else. And it's not so much the existing, it's not so much the regulation kind of, uh, it is a regulatory question, but it's not a problem of we need different regulation or new regulation here. What we just need is a decision within the existing regulation. So there is still a regulatory aspect. I don't think, for example, in this site, new regulation is needed. It's just a confidence that actually this is a good thing to do. This is the right thing to do. Any other questions? And one more. Yeah. Uh, and one from the audience. One of very interesting topics. Um, the company I work for is working today on the closure of the other range. Um, which is a very complex project around decontamination and such thing. But what practical advice would you give us for that closure? If other things we may not be thinking about, but we should start thinking about it. There are a number of things I think um, which. We can we can all learn from the ranger closure process. I think it's I think it's a process um, we can all learn from. What are the practical things uh, I can say today? Well, um, uh, you know, a time machine would be useful. Start the process <laughs> decades ago. That would have been useful. So I don't think I don't think that's something which you can. We can uh, advise Ranger today, but there are other locations which don't need a time machine because their their large closures are going to happen in ten years, twenty years, so thirty years. So I think um, time frames I think is a big one. I think the uh, the um, the engagement processes with the traditional owners is is a key aspect of that. I think. Uh, um, one of the things I think is quite distinct about that site, given where it is, which is quite a special place, I think that there are quite distinct options in terms of potential for tourism, in terms of potential for, for bringing visitors to that special place, I think. So... Um, Quite often, tourism is, is sort of recommended as a as a kind of magic solution to uh, pose it to. You know, we used to be minding this, we'll do tourism here, but not everyone wants to go to all, every place where there's ever been a mine. Um, but um, maybe range is a place where that, that could work. Yeah, so look, I think um, it's a really, it's a really uh, exciting opportunity. I would say, but in terms of lessons, there are many. The engagement with the traditional owners 
early and thoroughly and genuinely is, is a key one, but also the, uh, the time frames I think is, is another. But thanks for the question. And see, and you know, really great that you're working on that important issue. Okay. One more from my mind. So I'm interested in the linkage between the work of time stealing and the discussions between local, state, and national governments regarding transition functions and mechanisms. Good. I'd like to hear more about what work you're referring to. Um, maybe it's some work that we are connected with or some of our partners are doing. Certainly, there are different roles for different layers of government. And where I have seen some progress, I would say that getting those interactions uh, working well is very important. So particularly, I would say the connection between state government and local government. I think local government has a larger role to play in this than has been the case in the past. That will be different depending on particular site, particular situations, you know, the size of mines, the size of mine regions. Uh, I think it's, um, but it has, it has emerged in many places. And where I've seen examples of successful repurposing, uh, there have been, in some cases, greater connection between local government and state government and local government, for example, preparing business plans. I mean, we're coming back to that cable site, which we have on the screen here. One of the ways to overcome that kind of deadlock, well, we're not sure we want to approve you doing this because we're not sure we, it's going to work and we don't want to be left with a liability and so on. It's local government who have stepped in there to try and improve that situation. They're, they're the ones who are, who are looking at the way those risks or the way those issues will be managed. They're looking at the ones who are going to provide a business plan on local visitation on local services. So um, I would say that uh, greater involvement from local government is part of that, part of the solution there. Uh, and overall, I would say more coordination. Thanks. Well, if there are no further questions. Uh... I dream I should be able to talk now with you on the this. Okay. Um, just a quick point in regard to the historic civil societies, the settlements around Australia that are, have longevity that are being based on mining. But over time when mining has waned and then communities have come forward with resilience and dynamic opportunities and they've survived until the next flush of mining advancement or re-entry point, re-commercializations, et cetera. So if you put it in the context of, say, somewhere like Kalgoorlie Boulder in the goldfields of Western Australia, as modern mining is coming forward now and we're seeing this and then cumulative effects and the transition for energy futures and that dominance of mining coming back in and squashing that resilience and then opportunities and aspects that were built in that longevity of civil society, it's it's almost like it needs attention on that mining heritage aspect. Um, there are, there are, is a society there that exists without mining but are now being squashed because of the dominance of mining coming back again. So it's just a point to make that I would like the opportunity to discuss and get up as these projects move along. Look, thanks so much for the comment. Uh, I will mention that I think the historical and heritage aspects are very, very important. And I think uh, from my perspective, one of the lessons I've found from some of my own work in this area is, is that when mining does return to a region and during that time, a community may have moved on, it may have changed, it may have evolved, often does. 
the the key thing is that when mining returns, it is it returns in a way that is conducive to how the community is at that point it returns, not necessarily the community was one cycle ago or many cycles ago. Uh, it, 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 it returns in a way that is that is compatible with um, with the way the community has evolved, or those regions have evolved. And I've certainly seen that in some of my own work. So yeah, no, we're very happy to discuss that and yeah, I'd like to hear from you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Tom, for that very interesting presentation.